Good evening and welcome. Hello, Catherine. Hello. We meet again. <laughs> uh, for members that are uh, just joining us for the first time this week, Catherine and I also did a uh, food and wine uh, Christmas dinner. So the, the, the main course, should we say, on Wednesday. Um, and even since then, Catherine's done a members lunch, uh, festive members lunch in Stevenage as well. So we're really filling our boots with the festive foods this week, aren't we, Catherine? Oh, absolutely. It's really getting me in the Christmassy mood. It's great. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm glad to see you've got your lights on. I've decided now is appropriate to don. Oh, and the festive jumper. Excellent. <laughs> excellent. Yeah, I've decided it's finally appropriate to don, don the festive jumpers. You know, a turkey roast dinner is one thing. Could be just a normal roast. Yeah. Uh, a mince pie, non-negotiable. It's Christmas time, so <laughs> it had to be. It had to be Christmas jumpers. Um, but welcome, one and all. I hope that you're joining with some nice festive goodies this evening. Um, Catherine has bravely gone for all five desserts. I fell victim to the Christmas pudding shortage, and my Christmas pudding didn't arrive. Well done, Catherine. That's a whole. <laughs> A whole trifle. That's my weekend. <laughs> That's my weekend. Uh, I I've got all five wines, but sadly I'm missing my um I'm missing my Christmas pudding, which is devastating, really. But <laughs> safe to say, it was pretty fun experimenting to get all of these wines and puddings ready for this evening. So thank you for indulging us and indulging our sweet tooth. Uh, for members who haven't joined an event with us before, welcome. I'm Anna and this is Catherine from the Tastings team at the Wine Society. Um, where have you been? <laughs> um, feel free to watch this evening in either speak view or gallery view at the top corner of your screen. You can change the view. But to be honest, um, we're just going to be, we're, I'm going to present the first three and then Catherine will present the second, uh, or the, the, the final two rather. So hopefully um, it won't be too confusing anyway. Do, as I can already see, uh, some have started, feel free to use the chat to let us know where you are and what you're drinking. Um, and if you have any questions, we're going to do them as we go this evening as much as possible, but please pop them in the Q&A. Again, it's just Catherine and I this evening, so uh, it's much easier if they're in the Q&A. It comes into a little different box for us, which is a little Christmas box, um, nicely with a bow. So it's much easier for us to see the questions um, as the chat can sometimes get, um, get a bit muddled. So I think without further ado, if you weren't aware of the order this evening um, that was on your email just to just to run through it again, we're going to start with the mince pie and the Greek samos. We're then going to go to a sort of, um, Catherine, you made your own trifle, uh, not trifle, pardon me. You made your own meringue today, didn't you? Or you compiled, compiled it together. I, I assembled my, my meringue. Um, yes, unfortunately, I didn't quite have time to whip up the meringue itself, but I managed to get some components to get some, um, some cream and cranberries and orange and things together so well done everything um, is from the shops so members <laughs> who are also on the shop board this evening there is no judgment here <laughs> <laughs> yes none of mine is homemade I wish but maybe when we get closer to Christmas uh, but then after the samos and the mince pies we're going to go on to sotan and whatever fruity concoction you've made so I've got a, a cranberry lemon it's more of a posset actually if I'm honest uh, with some uh, pistachio nuts on we're then moving on to the Medi Tanat with the Yule Log. Uh, we're then going into Catherine's Sherry Trifle with, surprise, surprise, the Sherry. Fabulous combo. Um, and then we're finishing off with the Red Olivso at the end with the Christmas pudding, the star of the show. So those are your five wines. We'll tell you as we'll keep you up to date and talk you through it as we go through. Um, but without further ado, I think it's probably time. You all know what a mince pie looks like, but just in case you've forgotten. Um, my personal favourite uh, Christmas pudding, I will be honest. And I think it's also, <clears throat> pardon me, worth saying, I wanted to start with this wine um, and it actually just so happened um, that I wanted to also pair it with the mince pies. But for me, a mince pie is sort of the pudding equivalent of an aperitif. You know, you can have it in your hand with something. Um, and I think that this wine does the same. Uh, it's it's kind of an aperitif s. Yes, it's delicious and gorgeous and puddingy, um, but certainly it feels like something you could you could have after a cold walk or something. So I'll tell you a little bit about mince pies first. 
which should be fun. Um, mince pie obviously naturally started, as I'm sure many of you know, with mince meat. But I bet you don't know that in the 1390s, when it was first um, written as pork and eggs and saffron and spices all made into a pie it was called tarts of flesh <laughs> so original mincemeat pies were called tarts of flesh um I'm glad of the rebrand I will be honest um but that was in the 1300s we then have Samuel Pepys talking about them being a celebratory food so Christmas but also at weddings um, you then there was rumours of mince pies being banned by Oliver Cromwell or during his reign, if you can call it that. Um, not true. Don't worry. They've never been banned. Um, but sweet mince pies, as we know them, the beautiful things that they are today, occurred in the 1700s. And that's when the transition started to move them from um, meat to mince meat. Um, and actually, the recipe is not hugely changed since then so it was currants raisins maybe some apple certainly sugar even though it was very expensive then so it was a treat um and in a suet pastry and what I found interesting looking up um mince pies is that the suet pastry used to be layered with um orange and lemon peel which is still obviously very Christmassy but also made with red wine so a nice little link back there to, to wine um sounds delicious <laughs> um for this wine, now you could have gone with quite a few options, I will be honest, and, and I think probably the most traditional would be port. Um, I decided to go for a Vin du Naturel. Now, Vin du Naturel is a, um, a wine that is perhaps more famous in France. It's certainly a French speciality. And we've got, I think, three fortified uh, wines this evening. Sorry, no, that's a lie. We've got four fortifieds, um, technically two Vin du Naturels. Um, but it kind of encompasses a whole a whole group of wine types, but it's very much fortified like a port is. So if you think of a Van du Naturel as a sort of different kind of port, that's not a bad way of thinking about it. Um, some more famous examples. We'll have a reef so at the end. Uh, but Muscat de Bombe de Venise is, is a is a Van du Naturel. Now, if you've tried Muscat de Bombe de Venise before, if you've tried the Samos wine before, you'll know that they taste nothing like port. And that's down to the, the me other methods of production. Um, one of which is, of course, grape variety, because that makes a huge difference. Um, it's fortified, like I said, just like port. And what they do is uh, they add a neutral grape spirit. Um, and they do that so that the fermentation stops. And we won't go too techy tonight. It's Friday. We don't need to go, to, to go too geeky. It's all about the deliciousness. But um, essentially, when, that, when the yeast is eating up the sugar to create alcohol, what they do is they add that spirit and it halts it. So what are you left with? Well, the alcohol has topped up the quantity of alcohol. So normally you'd be doing that when the you're at about 100 grams of residual sugar left per litre. Um, and then so topping up the alcohol, but leaving that sugar gives you something usually, and this is a little bit lighter, actually, this particular one, I'll get it up. But it leaves you usually in the region of a normal Van du Naturel would be um, at about um, 17 to 18 degrees of alcohol. Um, generally, the feeling is to use the Muscat varieties for Van du Naturel because they, they cope very well, should we say. Um, this is a Muscat variety, but as you many clever ones of you may have spotted, it's not a French one, um, but it's Muscat or Grenache that tend to be common. However, there are about 20 different varieties that you can use to produce Van du Naturels around the world. And they come in a range of styles. You can use white grapes, you can do a rosé style, red that we'll obviously go on to. Um, this particular wine, it looks very brown, but it started life as a white wine. Um, and it's been aged. And one of the things that's beautiful about Van du Naturels is they can have, they can be unaged, they could be oak aged, they could be reductively produced. So you you end up with a, such a variety of styles. Um, so don't certainly don't think of Van du Naturel as one that's size fits all. It's a really good um, range of styles of wine. So let's talk about this one in particular. So, Catherine, would you say this is probably one of our favourite wines as a tastings team to use at tastings? I, I would. <laughs> yeah, it, we seem to, every chance we get, we seem to want to talk about the Samos. And, you know, I mean, you're going to tell us why, Anna, but it's a, a remarkable wine. Oh, 
It's a remarkable wine and the price just, it honestly bowls me over. I'm confused about this, why, why there's not a one in front of that nine. <laughs> you know, this is a, this is not an under £10 wine. What's happening? <laughs> but as I mentioned, it is Banjo Natural from Greece. And it's from the island of Samos, which was coincidentally the birthplace of Pythagoras, if anyone should be so interested. Um, they've been making wine here for over 3,000 years. Not always sweet um, and certainly not always fortified. Um, but um, a long, long history of winemaking. And uh, this, it, it was actually the first place in the whole of Greece to get AOC status, the protected status. So it's deemed high quality grape production area. Um, lots of the vineyards are about 800 metres above sea level. And I'll tell you why that's important in, um, well, I'll tell you now, why not? Um, one of the things that's lovely about sweet wines um, that are made really well is they have beautifully high acid. Now, Mus Muscat's not a hugely acidic grape variety. It does have some decent natural acids, but um, you kind of don't want it to get jammy um, or you don't want it to get overripe. So being at 800 metres above sea level allows this slow and steady ripening, which means the grapes can accumulate these natural sugars that you're going to then use later because this none of these wines, well, certainly... Um, yeah, none of the wines have sugar added per se, certainly not sugar, mm -hmm. sugar. Um, but this is this is all technically, if you think about it, grape juice. It's still grape juice. Nothing's been added other than an alcohol to stop the fermentation. Um, the grape variety used is actually a, a Greek native version of Muscat. So it's called Mushka. My Greek accent's going to be horrendous, so I'm not sure why I'm trying. Moshato White Samu. So it's a regional Muscat grape variety. And the beautiful colour I've already mentioned, it's been aged in wood for five years. And they kind of want it to reach this oxidative sort of colour. You know, it looks like it, it looks like it's going to taste. Is that a silly thing to say? Mm. It oh, looks caramelised. Yeah. Then, um, yeah. The thing I really love about this wine is, and I, I don't genuinely think, I don't believe that it's... Um, what am I trying to say? I don't I don't believe that I'm saying it because I know where it's from. I probably feel like they make it in this style and to this flavor because of the local foods. So if you think about some Greek foods, things like honey and orange and sort of orange blossom, you know, those sorts of flavors. Um, I'm kind of imagining just honey drizzled on a Greek yogurt. Um, and it's got those flavors in abundance. But the thing that makes it perfect for the mince pies for me is that lovely, beautiful searing acidity. But it's very currenty. Mm. Um, so it's got kind of like a, an orange, you know, those lovely light raisins. Um, it's got dried fruits, it's got dried apricots, it's got a nutty note to it that I think works really well with pastry. And then it does always come, and that's all on the nose, that's before I've even tasted it. Um, so it's sort of, it's, I even get a little bit of an Earl Grey tea smell to it. There's so much going on. Um, members, let us know if you are tasting it because I'd be so, so keen to, to, to know if it's the first time. Um, somebody's asked, um, Margot's asked, do you chill the Samos when serving it? I would suggest, I put, popped it in the email, but I would suggest 20 minutes in the fridge at least. It, it says um, on their website, I should mention this is a co-op that produces this wine, and it says on their website 15 to 17 degrees C. Now, I'd probably opt for even ever so slightly lighter, um, sorry, like more chilled. And the main reason I say that is because you're probably going to sit it in the middle of your table whilst you're enjoying some food. And so if you're not popping it straight back into the fridge and it's quite hard to keep at that temperature, um, Toby Morale's a big temperature stickler. And unless you've got a wine fridge, that's quite a difficult temperature to keep it at. So I would probably just suggest keep it in the fridge a little bit longer than, than you might have done normally. So 20 minutes plus. And then it means that whilst you're drinking the bottle, because it's not a huge bottle, it's just a little 50, 50 um, CL jobby. Whilst you're drinking it, it will come sort of around and open up. But it's a wine that packs enough punch that if you do serve it really cold, it will still be full of goods. Um, so I'm going to have a taste. I hope you are too, Catherine. I, I have. <laughs> As you were talking, I couldn't resist, unfortunately. But, oh, it's, it's so nice, isn't it? And I agree that the acidity... 
particularly the butteriness of the pastry, you know, it really refreshes it through. So sometimes I find that depending on how thick your pastry is for your, your um, mince pies, it can almost overpower your palate, but when you're eating it, because there's not enough filling. So actually the having the samos with it, with all those lovely Christmassy um, candied peel and curranty flavors, it gives you a little bit of a sandwich of that sort of Christmassy flavor around your pastry and the acidity to refresh it as well. I did notice earlier, I was having a look on their website too, and they were saying about how it's also very good with cheese. And I don't know members, if any of you also like a slice of Christmas cake with a bit of cheese on it, um, but this would be a very good pairing. Anna, you look very surprised. Members back me up that that's the thing. <laughs> it's on your Christmas cake. A little slice of Wensleydale, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. the first I've heard of such a thing. But you know, oh. that is also your bag. The Samos would be great with that too. <laughs> oh, how good. Well, there we go. I mean, it would also, uh, there is probably a, a better, I would say my next two wines, I would probably personally prefer. I was about to use the word better, and that was a bad choice. I would personally prefer with blue cheese. This would go with blue cheese, but I'd go for a light blue cheese. Um yes. oh, then it's fine. Ellen cheese. has backed me. Oh, I've been. <laughs> Where have I been living? Under some sort of hole. <laughs> this year, friend. Anna, this year is your year for cheese and Christmas cake. <laughs> Goodness. Right. Well, there we go. I've been <laughs> I've been reborn. <laughs> no, I think this would be good for that. And I actually was about to say, I think this probably, um, I would actually pair this with just some salty cheeses. It doesn't have to be a blue. Mm. I think the next, the particular the Sotan, but even the Tanat would would be a little bit more powerful for the blue. This is not quite as punchy as the next two wines, which is why I sort of referred to it as a aperitif wine early, which I'm sure other people would disagree with, but it's light enough to, to have that. So um, yeah, yeah. Delicious. but it would definitely delicious. be best choice. <laughs> David, saying get myself up north. Both my parents are from Cumbria and um, my uh, family, we get our Christmas cake from my auntie in the Lake District every year. She makes us our Christmas cake without fail it's sort of her tradition um so why I've never been offered the cheese element I don't know <laughs> I feel outraged <laughs> I need to write something to somebody <laughs> <laughs> right so I hope those tasting along enjoyed the Samos and honestly I was actually drinking the 2014 vintage I haven't tried the 15 I have no doubt it will be incredibly similar um, they make consistently good wines. If you haven't tried it and you just want to dabble in something that would sit in the fridge over a couple of evenings that you could have your cheese or your mince pies with or, or something along those lines for nine pounds something. You can't you can't beat it. It can't be done. I'm going to try. But <laughs> uh, yeah, we've not peaked too soon. But honestly, I really can't recommend it enough. So if you haven't tried it before, members, please do give it a go. Um, and like I said, there's 14 and 15 vintage available on the website. So I'm going to go on to, in the interests of time, the next pudding, which makes me sad because I want more of that, but I must. <laughs> um, now, I actually planned this because last year... Um, a famous supermarket who will remain nameless um, had a sort of pistachio orange nectarine cranberry thing um, with, and it was quite similar. Like you said, Catherine, it was sort of cream and, and, um, and meringue, etc. Now it doesn't exist this year. Um, and I did keep my eyes peeled, but actually, if I'm really honest, this wine would go very well with a lot of the sort of Christmas flavours that you get that aren't all of the others. We're covering chocolate here. We're covering sort of sherry and, and preserved fruits and all those sorts of things. But often you do get a, a pudding that has some clementine or, or orange, like you say, orange peel, lemon, um, but also some sweet spices. So often, um, or nuts. So often it would accompany, be accompanied with vanilla, pistachio, those sorts of festive things pomegranate as well which can be a tricky one to pair but I've tried Sauterne with pomegranate it's delicious um the nice thing about Sauterne is it's very generally a very complex wine Sauterne and Barsac and so if you've got a sort of base that is more on the fruity side and particularly um particularly the citrus fruits that be those dried citrus fruits or, or otherwise then I really do recommend the Sauterne 
Um, but before we go on to botrytis sweet wines, I just really want to, to quickly explain exactly what's going on here because this wine's made very differently. Um, these wines are made by effectively pressing what becomes a raisin rather than a grape. So you're constant. So you, before you've even picked them, you've already concentrated the berries. And by concentrating the berries, they have more acidity, more flavor, you know, by volume, um, certainly more flavor compounds within, within um, a surface area, if you will. There's more sugar and then obviously less water. So we're talking about concentration here. Um, it does mean that these wines are expensive and there's another, well, there's a few reasons why they're more expensive as well. But generally, if you're going to make a wine where you're pressing raisins and not berries, of course, it's going to be more expensive because you're getting much less liquid from each vine. Um, so quickly, before we go on to Sotan, there are another couple of ways that you can produce sweet wines from concentrated grapes. And I will mention them because they're quite interesting. Um, they won't quite get exactly the same outcome, um, but they're in the realm of this sort of um, really concentrated sweet wines that aren't higher in alcohol because they've been fortified. Um, so ice wine is one of them. Now, ice wine, as the name suggests, essentially means you, you press berries that have iced. Now, you could allow them to freeze. Um, it's dangerous in terms of you could ruin your crop, but you can. So you, you can allow them to freeze or you can pick them and then freeze them. Sometimes I feel like that's cheating, um, but it depends on the region and what the rules are. And then when you press those grapes, the, the water that is frozen sits on the top of the press and all the other gorgeous bits go through. So we do have an ice wine on the website at the moment. They are really rare. So if you fancy grabbing some, you know, that's a good one to go for. Um, and the main countries that produce those are Germany, um, Canada and, and China produces a lot of ice wine. Um, the other option, which is usually slightly more affordable, um, not always, but really normally can be more affordable, is recito, recciotto, sorry, pardon me, um, which is the Italian method, although it's not exclusive to Italy, but very popular in Italy, particularly in the Veneto area um, around Valpolicella. Um, you can pick the grapes and then dry them on straw mats or dry them hanging off straw mats. And you might've seen it as one of the most beautiful romantic things to behold. Um, and you can find those uh, sort of in various European countries, but drying those grapes and literally making raisins and then pressing them called recciotto uh, is the style of wine. So those are two. However, Sotern and Tokai, in particular, the two most famous, Sotern, Sotern Barsak and Tokai are different. And the reason they're different is that the way in which these are concentrated is by a um, fungus. Well, it's called Botrytis cinerea, um, AKA, more sexy name, noble rot. Um, and it is a rot and it infects the berry. And essentially what happens if you have your berry, you get, um, it takes about six weeks um, for the fungus to fully take hold. Um, and there's some special conditions I'll go into in a second, but it pierces the skin of the grape. And what that does is it dehydrates the grapes. It sort of sucks the moisture out, um, and, but it also imparts some really specific flavors. So a lot of people would say so terms great in a blind tasting because there are slightly different flavors that you get from, from um, botrytized sweet wines, which are things like honey, marmalade, ginger. Again, the ginger in particular for me. And but I also always get dried pineapple and dried mango. So. But those sort of ginger notes, um, marmalade and ginger are the two things that stick out for, for the southern west French versions for the Sauterne and the Barsac. So Sauterne and Barsac are two of the most famous places. They're just outside Bordeaux, about 25 miles south of the regions. And the reason they're so popular or famous is because um, they have the perfect conditions for botrytis. Um, you need misty mornings where fog comes in and the liquid settles on the grapes. But then, then, and this is the most important thing, you need a dry afternoon. If you get the rain and it stays, if the grapes become humid, you develop something called grey rot and grey rot ruins your grapes. So um, you do occasionally get grey rot across the board. And those are the years in which they don't make Sotern or Barsac uh, sweet wines. And really sad. Uh, but it, it's... Only certain varieties. So Semillon is the best. It's got thin skins. They pierce beautifully. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc is the other. And this is a Semillon Sauvignon blend. Um, and the other one in particular in Sotown uh, is, is Muscadel, um, which is kind of always the one that's under 10%, if 
if at all. This wine historically has always had a bit of muscadelle in, but I don't believe that the 2019 vintage does. Anyway, um, the other I mentioned there was going to be some there were going to be some more expensive reasons. What well, reasons why it's so expensive. One is that you have to hand pick and you have to select the grapes just at they're at the right time of the tritized uh, rot affecting them. It can take about two months to hand pick a vineyard and people go up and down each row day in, day out, not ready yet, come back again in three days. So the manpower is hugely expensive and they're also often produced in oak. So I'll get this one up and uh, there we go. Um, again, really, really affordable. Now it is a half bottle, so the bottle size is slightly smaller than the Samos, but still, uh, you know, it's lovely because often you don't want to open a whole bottle of sweet wine of an evening. So this is perfect. Um, but yes, it has been aged in oak and about 25% new oak. Now I think that's what gives it that extra vanillary pep, which I think is lovely for these sorts of sorts of wines. Um, fermented and aged in oak, actually. So you've also got not only the vanilla flavour, you get a lovely bit of texture as well. I find so many things going on here. There are dried fruits. So there's dried, um, dried pineapple and mango that I mentioned. Um, there are almost like a candied lemon as well coming on for me. Um, it's quite tropical. 2019 was a warm year, so we would expect slightly more tropical flavours. Um, but those sweet spices, vanilla, like we mentioned. Yeah, it's really lovely. There's so much going on. So you can really imagine it going with, with the um, all of the fruits in your pud. Um, the other nice thing, again, Semillon and Sauvignon tend to have pretty decent acidity. Um, and because we're talking about the grape being shriveled, the acid actually is still quite high in those shriveled grapes. Um, in terms of who, it, who this is made by, it's made by uh, Chateau Contigui, and that is Denis uh, Dubaudou. Um, it's his family estate. Um, and if, sorry, Denis Dubaudou. And if anybody knows Denis Dubaudou, he um, sadly died in 2016, but he consulted for the likes of Yikem, the most famous um, sweet wine estate in the world. Uh, very expensive. Uh, wines um, and he's sort of the godfather of white wine production both dry and sweet in Bordeaux so um, it's made by you know some of the real legends of the industry. Catherine have you got this one as well? I did <laughs> um, <laughs> yes no I do I mean this is actually being in the half bottle is very convenient so it's actually one that I've I have more often than not when I want um, a, a sweet wine because it isn't something that I drink overly regularly, but when I do want it, it's one that I'll turn to. And again, you know, with our own label ones, it's that lovely consistency. So I, <clears throat> excuse me. I, <clears throat> you always know what you're getting. You will always have, yeah. I think that's the other lovely thing about, a lot of people might say, oh, this is a very young Sota and being 2019. Yes, it is. But the nice thing is, you know that it's going to be good now and you know it's going to be good in five years time. They do age beautifully, Sotans. Um, but it's nice because you can expect the quality to be good. So you can buy them and lay them down and trust that the quality is going to be good enough. You know, you don't sort of need somebody's approval to say, yes, that will work. Yes, that won't. They will always lay down beautifully, these Sotans. Um, it just depends how you like to drink them, actually. I really like um, the younger style. I love it when it's fruity. Um, but as Sotan starts to develop, it does get a sort of more dried, more raisiny. Um, and it gets some interesting characters that I think are really attractive. But often the food I'm pairing with my Sotan, I want it to be vibrant. Um, so it's personal choice, really. So, yes. Um, really? Now, oh, sorry, Catherine. I was just going to mention that, um, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, members, the meringue's gone down the wrong way. John <laughs> Britton has just commented in the chat that he was puzzled to see um, Barsak on the cork, but has read that Barsak is allowed to use either term, Sauterne or Barsak, but Sauterne isn't allowed to use Barsak. Yes, it's a very good point. So, um, exactly. So a Sauterne can be a Barsak, but a bar sorry, I phrased that badly. Um, Barsak is all encompassing. So Sotan is a part of Barsak, if that makes sense. So, um, but what you can't do is have, if you open a bottle, if it says Sotan, 
explain that terribly. Catherine, you probably were about to do a better job than me. Um, but yes, if you if it says Barsack on the cork, that's fine. It's they're much of the same muchness. It's the other way around that doesn't work. Um, which I always find strange, but I suppose a lot of um producers would say I'm in Barsack, but the brand of Sotan, I would argue, is bigger. I don't know how you feel about that, Catherine. It's an interesting question that I pro probably could ask three different producers and get three different answers. But I suspect that sometimes because Sotern is the more famous, um, they might use that name more readily, perhaps. But the appellation system is a bit strange that it allows for, for both. But to be honest, the regulations are almost identical. <laughs> yeah. Barsak exactly. and Sotern, very similar. Right. Gosh, I, I've never been to time this well. I said by eight o'clock, I wanted to start on the Yule log. Catherine, has that ever happened? No. No. <laughs> no. no, it has not. Um, Christmas please, miracle. Please <laughs> we'll keep asking questions, members, and let us know. Obviously, we don't want to. Well, I wouldn't mind sitting here all evening. I could quite gladly finish off the rest of these. But um, no, do ask questions as we go. We'll stick around a bit at the, towards the end as well. But please feel free to, to ask. Um, so Yule Log, um, I did not know the history of the Yule Log until this event, which has really, um, maybe I'm just terrible with Christmas traditions. Something's wrong with me. Um, I didn't realise that the burning of the Yule Log is a thing. Um, I, for my sins, sort of thought it was the, the sort of early 1900s equivalent of Colin the Caterpillar where they just needed to have a chocolate dessert and make it look like a, a um, something that kids would like or something. No, not at all. Um, so excuse my ignorance, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I found out. Um, the Yule log was a big log that you used to burn for the 12 days of Christmas, but it's, we're not talking a log. It was a tree, basically. And you'd start it on the first day and you'd burn a bit and then you'd take it off. And goodness knows how you sort of put it out or you didn't have just burning embers in your house. And then on the second day, you'd add a little bit more. And by the 12th day, you were supposed to have, um, have burnt your whole your log. Um, you weren't allowed to buy a log. That was bad luck. Um, but in the UK, coopers or barrel makers um, often gave customers their old logs and misfits that they couldn't use. So they're all pieces of wood that weren't quite right for making their barrels. So I thought that was another good fun um, wine link. So all the coopers for making in those days, probably actually more beer barrels, but still certainly barrel or cider barrels. Um, but I'm sure there were some wine coopers giving away their wine barrels. Um, and the Yule log or the Bouche de Noël, as it's called in France, um, only became... Um, a dessert or pudding, uh, I want to say, hmm, which I want to say it was Charles III. Don't hold me to that, members. Um, but it became a dessert or a pudding around the, the rule of Charles III. Um, and it's obviously a chocolate sponge with cream layers. And then you can decorate the outside should you wish. It is eaten in the UK, France and Belgium. And um, yes, that some people believe that it turned chocolatey by Charles III. It could be second, but I really think it's third. Um, Charles III's private personal baker or private chef. Um, by the way, I know that there's no Charles III. I'm talking about of Monaco in France. Sorry, I know there's no Charles III of, of UK, of Britain, England. Charles III of Monaco uh, produced this, this, his baker produced this log. So I believe that's where the tradition comes from. Um, and for my sins, I'm not on Great British Bake Off. So we're talking about the wine. So I'll go on to the wine. <laughs> before I get even more confused with my Charles's. Um, but for anyone who doesn't know, this is what a traditional Yule log looks like. And I've never produced anything quite that beautiful, but there we go. Um, now, the Maidy Tanat. Oh, my goodness, what a wine. When we were doing these, um, what tends to happen when we do these is we prep the lists really early. So I couldn't find a Yule log when we were doing this. I actually could find mince pies. Um, I was probably doing this back in October, but I'm sure that doesn't surprise many of you. Um, but I couldn't find a Yule log, so I just used a regular chocolate pudding and I put cream with it. And um, my husband was a bit confused and he sort of said, it's the, the wine isn't sweet enough. And I said, I actually have to disagree 
Um, I think the, this wine works perfectly because it's not overly sweet. Um, there's something quite bitter about proper cream. And I think when if it had been chocolate and a ganache sauce or something, then yes, this doesn't have enough sweetness. But because there is a, I often, do you find the same, Catherine? There's kind of like a bit of a, a acidic and acetic taste to cream that can actually bring a, a pudding down a notch on the sweetness level. And so that cream filling for me actually made a huge, huge difference in my wine choice. I think the lactic acids in the cream add that sort of savoury note to it so it isn't overly sweet particularly yeah exactly and so so there's a reason so you can see on the on the screen here it's a six um on our sweetness scale out of nine so I think it's the least sweet actually or Oloroso might be we're probably similar um but I think personally it works for me it is fortified again so the alcohol is 17 um and it's um this time using instead of our first fortified wine this time we're using the Tanat grape variety now Tanat as its name suggests is very tannic it's a big bold red wine in the dry reds that it makes in the the region where this wine is from it is serious stuff um, you know, the sort of wine where you've got black teeth after two glasses. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so in the, the Madaran region where it's made, it now has to be, I think, 50% of the dry red wine. So if you ever have a Madaran, you will have already tasted the great variety Tanat before. Um, but this particular producer has worked tirelessly to make sure that the Tanat is, is not too punchy um, and they work really well with the dry wines but they've been producing this wine since about the 1940s and experimenting with it um, this is vinified in oak barrels again and oak foudre so the large ones um, and it then has about 12 to 15 months of softening up the tannins and giving those sort of slightly woodier notes which is really nice for me and I also get a bit of mo mocha like a chocolate and coffee note. It's not sweet chocolate, it's more mocha coffee. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the, this particular producer is near the village of Madaran, so uh, Chateau Devi, um, and they are specialists in Tanat. Uh, it's produced by a company, a company, sorry, a family called the Laplace family, um, and several generations of winemakers there. And they recommend chocolate puddings which is very good um, but they also recommend blue cheese so I did say that these two wines were perhaps uh, better blue cheese wines and I also have to be honest Catherine I have tried and love this wine with Christmas pudding um, and I think that's sort of yeah it goes with a lot of stuff but it's intense so it needs to be a full flavoured pudding um, you don't want yeah you don't want sort of a it certainly wouldn't go with a fruit pudding. It's not going to no, go with that. It's absolutely not anything for a slightly more delicate, wimpy pudding. It's got so much lovely red fruit. I think having it with the Yule log, it really does get a little bit of almost um, Black Forest Gatto vibes. That lovely Kirschen yeah. cherry and black cherry. It's, oh, it's great. I like the idea of Kirsch as well. I think there's something quite, um, one of the things that this reminds me of, and I know it's not grown anywhere near that, so don't worry, my geography is not as bad as my history. <laughs> um, but one thing that I do think, it kind of has that um, wintry alpine thing going on. So yeah. it's the sort of wine that you want in a hip flask walking up a snowy mountain. Um, it's almost port without the sweetness. So it's sort of bigger and more robust and punchy and it's a real gutsy, gutsy sweet wine. Um, and I like that. I think that's much more appropriate for a really dark chocolate pudding. But that mm -hmm. part of my problem is I don't have the most overt sweet tooth. And so for me, when, when people pair chocolatey puddings with Pedro Jimenez or something, you know, very, very, very sweet sherry, I can find it too much. And I really like the balance here between what is effectively a slightly sweet red wine um, and, and a punchy slightly sweet red wine um, and, a, and a darker chocolate pudding. So I hope if any members are tasting it, they're enjoying it. Please let me know. Catherine, have you, other than your red fruited, did you get the kind of coffee mocha thing as well? I did. And it, it goes really nicely because I find always as well, you know, with a Yule log, 
cocoa and chocolate always has that little bit of bitterness anyway and that's sort of slightly dusty character um to it which i think comes across in the wine as well probably in part to the um little bit of the structure from the tan in there from the the tannic um quality of the tanat tanat tannin <laughs> all, all the teas tonight um but yeah i think it's it's um and you're saying in terms of it going with christmas pudding as well i think you're you're very right and i might even talk about it in terms of trifle as well not necessarily this one Ooh. but um but when we get on to that but you know i think it's it's um obviously i don't want to make it i don't want to diminish it but you saying sort of to have it on a snowy walk in a hip flask it's almost a non-warm version of a mulled wine without too much of the spice I completely agree with you. Yeah, you've not really got the cinnamon, but you do have that lovely red fruit. You've got kind of a an alcohol warming sensation that I think yeah. heating up mulled, mulled wine actually makes it feel more alcoholic. Mm. Um, so you've got that sort of warming sensation, but it's not, um, yeah, it's just not really sticky. Yeah. If somebody said I want a sticky wine, I wouldn't say this was up there. This is not a sticky wine. And yeah. I think that's probably why my husband poo-pooed it and didn't think it was right. But I said... I don't know. I think there's a I real place for this. I think it and is. And to be honest, Marcel, our buyer, if we ever say we're doing a chocolate pudding, he always just says, Maybe Tanat. Maybe. <laughs> and a lot of the reason behind that can often be that, uh, I mean, if you have a very, very, very sweet chocolate pudding, it's almost impossible to pair a decent wine with it because mm. sweet, sweet chocolate puddings are a real challenge. But you mentioned cocoa just there, Catherine. That bitterness, if you really are making a proper chocolate pudding, not a, not a sugar bomb, I can't think of anything better. So there we have it. Right, Catherine, I'm going to um, hand over to your lovely self now. Lovely. I'll Let just me just check, uh, pour myself a little glass of the sherry to start. Julia Shore says she's to? had a vaguely similar sounding sweet muvelle from Sonoma. How um, interesting. I, yeah, very good with chocolate too. Keep a look I think there's that, something, maybe. Catherine's Catherine's onto something as well with the tannins and chocolate bitterness and, and all of those things going quite well. And if something's really poor quality chocolate full of sugar, it's not going to go with the wine anyway. So absolutely, you may as well go high quality on the chocolate and then go with the Made E Tanner. <laughs> Lovely. Lovely, hey. right. Let's go on to uh, pudding and wine at number four, which is, so pudding is sherry trifle. Um, I will talk a bit about trifle to start with, because obviously we've chosen sherry trifle as that's perhaps one that is most traditionally had at Christmas. And if you're a trifle purist, it might be the, the only trifle you recognise. However, see, as the years have gone on and flavours have you know, developed and changed and Heston's done all of his things for Waitrose. You've got all sorts of trifles on the market now um, or all sorts of trifles you might make yourself. So I will talk about this in terms of focusing on a sherry trifle, but I think a good rule of thumb in terms of what to pair with a trifle and Fiona Beckett has got a really great article on her um, food and wine matching website about this is to kind of go with the flavours that are in your trifle. So if you are having perhaps a orange um, based trifle, something like a Contro or other sort of orange based liqueur or even a tawny port or perhaps the Samos from earlier on. And then say you are having a chocolate and cherry trifle, something like the, the Maidy, the Tanner would be quite nice to soak the, the sponge into. But I am quite the traditionalist when it comes to trifle. Um, so sherry is the way that I go. It's what I was brought up on I think it's safe to say I was probably drinking sherry before I was drinking wine purely based on the amount that went into trifle and my mum would always use a cream sherry from um, a very well-known brand which I'm not going to say but I'm sure you'll all be familiar with who I'm referring to um, and that was delicious but this sherry that we're going to talk about is one that I think just has that extra bit of punch but a couple of little facts about uh, trifle before we carry on it's really a very quintessential sort of English British dessert the earliest use of the name trifle 
was in a recipe for a thick cream flavoured with sugar, ginger and rose water, which was featured in Thomas Dawson's 1585 cookery book um, entitled The Good Housewife's Jewel, um, which sounds a thrilling read. And then jelly is something that really does um, feature a lot in, in, in trifles. Not ours. Um, we tend to go with a tinned strawberry, which... <laughs> Members, if you if you make trifles yourself, let me know what you put in yours. Um, but jelly was first recorded in some of the later editions of Hannah Glass's 18th century book, The Art of Cookery. And she instructed using hartshorn or um, which is sort of like calves feet to get the gelatin. There are some other variations around the world based on trifles. So in Germany and Austria, they have punch tort, which um, the literal Google translation is eggnog pie. And in Italy, they have a dessert very similar and likely based on an English trifle called zuppa inglese, which literally translates to English soup. So it has seen its way around. And food historians do think it's actually the um, origin of sort of layered sponge cakes. So it's a nice little bit of trifle history before we start. So. The cherry that we have decided or that I've chosen for this one is the As You Like It Medium Sweet Amontillado Blend from Williams and Humbert. There we go. We've got the lovely screenshot there. I love this bottle as well. It just feels very Christmassy. Um, it feels like something you'd see on a traditional Christmas card left out for Santa. And I mean, look at the colour. Isn't it gorgeous? It's just really, really caramelized and vibrant. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Amontillado Sherry. Obviously, I don't want to go too technical. We've got some great articles on the website if you want to have a little bit more um, in-depth look at types of sherry. But the most interesting thing I think about an Amontillado is that it is a sherry that is aged both biologically and oxidatively. So in general, there's sort of two camps of sherry production. You're oxidatively aged, so your things like your pheno and your manzanilla, which are, um, sorry, you're biologically aged, your pheno and manzanilla, and then oxidatively aged, which are things like Amontillado, and then into your Olorosos. This gives it a bit of the best of both worlds. So the biological aging takes place under a layer of floor, which is the dead yeast cells um, from the production. And that gives a really lovely yeasty character to it, um, like a bread dough, a bit of sort of baker's yeast. And then again, this is a fortified wine. So they fortify it to above 16 degrees. And at that point, the floor can't survive anymore. So that dies off, but they leave the wine to continue aging oxidatively. And that introduction to oxygen is what gives it the lovely amber color and it gives it the really nice nutty caramelized aromas and flavors. They then blend the wine in the Solara system. So that's if you've seen images of sort of the barrels stacked on top of each other and then it moves its way down. So it blends through to the, um, the correct blend that they'd like. And then to make this a sweet, medium sweet blend, so it's actually seven. So it's a little bit sweeter than the, um, the May I think, Anna. They add a little bit of Pedro Jimenez sherry. So that is the naturally sweet sherry, just to bring the sweetness level up a little bit. It's not, I wouldn't say it's an overly, overly sweet wine because it still does have a lovely bit of acidity there as well. But it is sweet enough to stand up to your cream and custard and fruit in your trifle. Now, this one particularly from Williams and Humbert was actually, um, they only discovered the sort of the Solera system, the barrels for it in uh, around 30 years ago in their winery when they were having a bit of a change um, and a bit of uh, renovation in the winery. And then um, it was only bottled for the first time six years ago because the overseer was the only one that knew it actually existed. So there's a nice little bit of a, a story to it uh, coming into existence as well. And it's got that really deep amber color, really, really perfumed nose of caramel and toast and a bit of toffee there as well. If 
like you may want to um, put some sort of toasted nuts on top of your your trifles that really does um, come through with this as well so some sort of toasted almonds there's also a little bit of mocha with this as well I know some people I say some people me and my mum <laughs> would like to pop a bit of a crumbled flake on top um, so all of those flavors the thing about trifle is you've got so many flavors textures and components going on so you've got obviously the the cream which we've spoken about if you haven't sweetened it it's almost got a quite a savory lactic quality then you've got your your custard layer which has that lovely vanilla creaminess and quite a smooth texture then you'll have your sort of fruit and sponge all combined which texturally can be a little bit of a mush um because you, you don't necessarily have as fresh or crunchy fruit. So it all blends in together. And do you know what? I'm as well as to pair it with the dessert, I do think you could make your trifle with this one as well. I don't know whether you would necessarily want to not waste it because it's all going to the same place. <laughs> but if you would like to um, do it, I think it absolutely would stand up. It's got some really lovely fruit there. There is almost a bit of a strawberry quality to it, a bit of a like a sort of strawberry juice, a confected strawberry juice there. So I don't have, I sadly, my bottle didn't arrive in time. It was my own fault. I didn't order it fast enough. Um, so I've actually got the medium dry Oloroso blend, Catherine, because I just thought I'd have a sherry to taste with you. But it is medium dry. And I have to say, having tried the As You Like It before, it's not going to work the same. So it's important, members, to go for that medium sweet, the isn't sweetness. it? That's Absolutely. really important. And the, yeah, the sweetness is the key thing for this, particularly, you know, we've, we've mentioned a couple of the wines as good with cheese, but this is um, the festive puts. And it's the main thing is to have your sweetness in balance with the dessert you're choosing. Williams and Humber are very long standing uh, producers of sherry products. They were founded in 1877 by Sir Alexander Williams, who was a great admirer and connoisseur of sherry products and Arthur Humbert, who is a specialist in international relations, which um, I think works quite nicely if you're going to move to Jerez and try and make your name as a, a sherry, sherry house. They've got 250 hectares of vineyards in the Jerez Superior region. And obviously, if you've been to Jerez at all, you'll know that the vineyards have the lovely Abaritza soil, which is the very, um, very white, very sort of um, houseless sort of Similar to limestone, very absorbent. It's soil that's have been um, formed it from. It looks like of, sand, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. It's been formed from the sort of breakdown of a lot of marine creatures over the years. Um, it doesn't sound particularly pleasant, but it is perfect for the ripening of the grapes. So this is the Palomino grape that is used to create this sherry. And it's got relatively thin skin. Um, so the white soils help really ripen it. And they also mean that in, you know, Jerez has got a very dry, warm climate. So there's not much water. So it helps retain the water to help the, well, the vines to grow and the grapes to grow. Um, it also, Palomino, it has a very low acidity, relatively low acidity naturally as well, which is really beneficial for oxidative aging. And the great thing about this having been oxidatively aged as well is that once you've had it open, it will last a good old, a good while. I mean, I, Anna was saying, you know, we were trying these pairings um, quite in advance to get them ready for the event tonight. I must have opened this bottle maybe three, four, maybe even five weeks ago. And it's it's just been... I mean, it's actually just been sitting next to my TV, if I'm honest, on the side in the living room. How is there any left, um, Catherine? <laughs> I know. I've been really, you know, making sure I don't drink it all so I could use it this evening as well. But it, it lasts perfectly. It's perfectly fresh. I did pop it in the fridge just to have a little chill for about 15 minutes because um, I do think chilling it does help it come, have the flavours come out. But, you know, now that this event is done, I can't see it lasting much longer. But it will last and it's it's not one that you have to necessarily take too much care over either which I think is very nice so members if you've got any of them this let us know what you think 
but definitely do take into account that it has to be on the sweeter end. So the medium sweet rather than medium dry. I'm really jealous. When you said you'd chosen this one, I thought it was a really smart choice because you mentioned it at the beginning, obviously it's been aged in both ways and mm-hmm. sherry is such a complex and complicated pudding to pair. I wasn't really jealous when we divided up the puddings. I thought, yeah, okay, you can have that one, Catherine. Yeah. <laughs> and then when you said you were going to use this one, I thought, oh, that's an absolute no brainer because yeah, it's, it's had two quite significant stages of its life, meaning that it's got some, um, you know, some character has come from, from, the floor aging and then some from the oxygen aging or oxidative aging so yeah a brilliant choice just jealous of you now I'm just double checking it still works yeah it does, <laughs> it does. <laughs> I'm also thinking I'm gonna have to now eat a whole trifle <laughs> over the weekend so that will be fine I've got plenty of sherry left so lovely now Fantastic. shall we take a look at the final pudding perhaps the main event pudding the og christmas pudding of the festive season (laughs) so of course this is a christmas pudding um not one that was lit i did try and see if i could share a um video of my my own lit christmas puddings but unfortunately it wasn't quite good enough quality um but it is one of those desserts, isn't it? When you try and describe it to someone that you, who's never really had it before or doesn't perhaps understand it, you say, oh, to round off Christmas dinner, we bring out this lovely fruity rich pudding and then we set it on fire and then we all cheer and then we all eat it. Um, but a little bit about the Christmas pudding. So its origins were in medieval England and it was known um, then as plum pudding or sometimes just simply pud. And in those pre-Victorian times, plums didn't actually refer to the plum, but actually was the word they would use for raisins. It was Elizabeth Acton who first referred to it as Christmas pudding in her best-selling 1845 book, Modern Cookery for Private Families. And it's one of these desserts that has then had a lot of tradition and um, meanings attached to it after the effect. So it's a sort of a big component now to um, stir up Sunday in the sort of uh, Christian calendar. So the Sunday before Advent begins. And it's because they think there's the the standard 13 ingredients symbolizing Jesus and the 12 apostles. There's also the element of stirring east to west. So the direction of the Magi to visit baby Jesus. Whether that's actually true or whether it's a nice story to attribute to the seasonal pud, um, who knows? But it's, it's a nice little story to it. Of course, there's also other elements where you could include little tokens, perhaps a silver coin for good fortune, a wishbone for good luck, a thimble for thrift, and then um, a small anchor for safe harbour, all for the coming year. And of course, If you are a Christmas Carol fan, there's a lovely description from Charles Dickens um, about how Mrs. Cratchit would bring the pudding in for the Cratchit family. And there was a great celebration. She'd lit the pudding and it was blazing in half of a half a quarter ignited brandy, which I think is the only way to serve a pudding. I unfortunately have a tiny little microwaved pudding this evening, but it does the trick to show how it goes with the next wine. So I am just going to pour myself a little. Oh, Ellen has just said the collect for Advent Sunday starts. Stir up, we beseech thee. Yes, it does. And I was having a look at that history wise today um, and apparently stir up in that context was sort of denoting um, stir up like the people. So to sort of collect in arms and things um, for, you know, a bit of a, a contribution. But I mean, I'm, I'm no theologian, so whether, whether or not that I've understood that um, is another thing, but it does absolutely stir up We Beseech Thee. And I know the Queen likes to do a big thing. I think a couple of years ago, there was a video of her and little Prince George stirring up a pud together. So it's got a nice bit of tradition. Now, this wine that we are going on to is the, let me just pour a bit more in so you get a bit of a better look, is the Reeve Soul, 
It's the Rive Sur Ombre from Domaine de Rancy, and it's a 1998 vintage. So it's quite, um, quite old in, it's the oldest of the wines that we're showing today. I will just show you the color again. It's darker than the sherry and even and the um, Samos that we've had. But again, this is based off of a white grape. So this is Macabo predominantly. It's about 95% Macabo, um, which is also known as Viora in Spain. So it's a Catalan variety. It does have around 5% of Grenache in there as well. But of course, like many grapes, the like most grapes, the flesh itself is white. So you're not actually getting um, the color from the, the grape itself. So Reef Salt is an Appellation Origine de Controle for Van de Naturel wines in the Languedoc Roussillon in South France. And I won't go over Van de Naturel again. So Anna did an excellent job earlier on, which made it easier for me now. But this is made from um, the estate of Domaine de Rancy. They've been in operation since the 20s. And it's now run by Jean Hubert and Brigitte, his wife. And the demand for um, sweet wines in the, the sweet reef salt wines that they were producing in the sort of 70s and 80s meant that they actually sent um, a lot of the other red grapes that they grow. So they don't just produce reef salt in Domaine de Rancy, but the other grapes that they grew and wines that they produced, they actually sent to the um, cooperative village cellar to be made so that they could concentrate their efforts on the reef salt because it was so popular. That did change in the early 2000s when they had a bit of a renovation of their own um, winemaking facilities and cellar. So they sort of brought everything back in house, especially when their daughter, their daughter Delphine joined the estate in 2006. So like I said, this is 95% um, Macbo with about 5% Grenache. And the Macabo is chosen specifically for the aromatics that you get. So this is a really, really lovely raisiny, but I think a golden raisin. It's those sort of lighter raisins. Um, there's almost, there's a bit of dried apricot there as well, I think. So it's dried fruit, but it's more on the golden end for me. And then it's got that little bit of Grenache for a bit of body. which does give that little bit of structure and boldness to it. It's still very, very fresh. And they do also let it age for quite um, a period on its fine leaves. So that gives it that lovely bready yeasty quality. And it's almost like a, the pastry from the mince pies earlier. It's not a, um, it's not a real bri brioche. It's not real sort of, sweet sweet bread it's um it's quite a, a nice sort of fresh yeast quality to it and I think that just helps balance out the fruit and the richness but I think I don't know if you'll agree Anna the the richness of the fruit and things on the nose follows through on the palate but it's so much fresher and brighter on the palate which I think is absolutely necessary for something like a Christmas pudding, which already has a hell of a lot of dark fruit in there. It's got, um, you know, a lot of sort of a brandy, there's stout, there's a lot of other booze components going on. It's a lot of richness. And there's the, there's suet. So whether you're using beef suet or vegetarian suet, you've got that textural um, fat element that really combines everything in a Christmas pudding. So you do need the freshness on the palate from the wine, from the reef salt to really balance that out together. I find the freshness really amazing in this wine. I actually, Catherine, I don't know whether you spotted me. I just had a bite of my mince pie with some because I was trying to work out why I didn't, because I tried this with the mince pies. I did opt for the Samos. And I think one of the reasons was that for me, the sa I tend to eat mince pies as like an afternoon treat. Mm. Um, and so for me, the Samos makes sense because, as I mentioned, that's the one that you might keep in your fridge and dip in and out of. That's a, maybe a bit sort of um, easier, to be honest. 
this is perfect with anything with that mince meat I think at the end of the meal Mm, this is definitely an end of meal wine but one of the reasons I really enjoy it is the freshness that you've just described is not a freshness that you get from the likes of the Sauterne where your mouth is necessarily watering there's almost like a kind of prickly um it's a real it's a real assault to the senses of freshness you don't have to think about it oh yes my mouth's watering it's like oh it almost goes up the nose in a uh, you know in a kind of not peppery or horseradishy but you know when you get freshness it's a physical experience absolutely it's almost a little it's not got the flavors of sherbet but it's the quality of it it's the real palate fresher so when you're having it with something like the Christmas pudding, which is very rich, very dense, it's it's all about that harmony and the balance between the two. For me, I think this is probably the treat wine of the evening. Yeah. Um, this is the wine that you would savour mm. and that you that you indulge in more so than any of the others. I having tried the as you like it in the past, that's probably up there as well. But I think there's a lot going on in that wine and it's it's very much a kind of experience you know yeah. the age you've got like you said those dried fruits but they're not candied in any way they're really stewed dried um lovely lovely stuff mm. oh I'd love to hear if any members are trying that along with us this evening or have tried it before yeah I would say as well, similar to the As You Like It, this has been open the same amount of time and it is absolutely still just as fresh. So if it's not one that you're thinking that you would, you know, if you don't have many sweet wine drinkers in in your family, whoever you're spending Christmas with, it's not one that you have to rush through. So although, why would you not want to? (laughs) Um, We've had a question from John and I'm going to be honest, Catherine, I'm not sure I know the answer, but I can probably hazard a guess as I'm sure you could as well. Um, Why is, because members, we do have another um, Roncy vintage for sale. Um, We often have a few. We've had the 1998 for a while. I think Marcel might have bought a large amount, but they do go back a long time. I think we've got a bit of 70 as well. Yes, and I think that might be the one the member's referring to. We've got 1960 Ooh. and 1970. Mm. Now, um, my understanding is they're actually different wines. So just to make sure I've understood, um, the important bit here, can we see a photo of the bottle? Of course you can. So this is the ombre. Way. Exactly. Yeah. Where So this is not to say... Well, that doesn't really help, unfortunately. That doesn't say ombre on it. Um, but the 1998 is the name the does. So it's and the ombre the wines, they're aged slightly differently, aren't they, Catherine? They're actually sometimes aged in demi mood and in yes. those glass jars. And um it can often give a slightly gr- greeny colour. Am I right in saying that? I think so. It's similar. Um, not too dissimilar to Madeira in that sort of green hint that you can get around around the edge of the glass there, um, like the skin of a skin of an almond, a fresh almond there. But because it is done differently, it does then affect the um, the drinking window. So the sixty and the seventy that we have available are able to um, age that bit longer. However, um, having we actually had this one with um, Marcel and we did a little tutor tasting up in Cardiff uh, last month. He would say that it would go longer still. So we are always a little bit conservative on our on our drink windows. Um, and out of any of the buyers, perhaps I would say, I don't think I, I'd be remiss in saying that he is the one that would give them the longest. Um, yeah. And perhaps even, you know, he's said himself, it can go, can go longer as well. So. And it's interesting what you say about keeping it open, Catherine. I mean, I, I tend to get a bit nervous about keeping sweet wines open and it's worth members just sort of being aware that yes, sweet wines last a little bit longer because sugar is slightly a preservative. Mm. Alcohol is a preservative. And when I say last longer, I do mean open, open longer. But please, please, please don't assume that they will go forever. There are very few sweet wines that do. Madeira is one. Um, Madeira is made in all sorts of other ways. Um, it's heated and then cooled down and heated and cooled down. And it's basically built to last. But something like your Sautern, I really would drink that within a week. 
um, if you want to get it for a top quality, which is why, as Catherine mentioned, half bottles are so fantastic because, yeah. you know, you could have that um, over a few evenings. But yes, the 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 fear I have sometimes is that um, there's a tendency to think, oh, it's a sweet wine, it will last. Um, I know people that put port back in the cupboard and wait till next year and drink sherry the following year. They'll be fine. They won't be as they're at their optimum. Mm. So my strong recommendation is try and drink it with someone. Yeah, always. <laughs> if you don't have anyone to drink it with, invite Catherine and I around. Absolutely, <laughs> we'll help you out. I would we'll add help. As well, Ada, I think um, a big thing for me, not obviously the the Samos and the Sauterne, this doesn't apply because they're clear bottles, but with the others, um, well, it, they do. It does apply, but with the others particularly, is how you're storing them. So once they're opened keep them in the bottle that they're in. They're a nice dark glass for a reason. It stop any of the light um, affecting them. Obviously at Christmas, you might want to get out your decanters, your nice sort of cup glass. It does look lovely, but they're not the best way to, now, you know, I've said I've kept one in the bottle next to the telly. It's not the best way. I should really pop it underneath in a bit more of a, a darker corner. But if you've got it in a sort of a crystal decanter on the sideboard, it's not going to last as well. So if you have an idea that you're only going to drink so much, pop it in the decanter and then you can serve it from that and it will look lovely. But in ter- don't pop your whole bottle in and then just keep it in there forever because, you know, it's um, it will last, but you want it to last so that you can enjoy it as it goes. Yeah, and I think that's the thing. You want it at its absolute prime and refrigerating is a good idea as well isn't it Catherine and obviously yes. the fresh lights go dark don't worry it's not bright in there but refrigerating is a good idea so if you if you know you're drinking a wine in two sittings even if you're having it at room temperature you know if you're having something on on boxing day and then again on new year's eve or something like that please do pop it in the fridge in between that time it will definitely last if it's refrigerated and then if you're drinking it at a slightly warmer ten- temperature just let it warm up naturally yeah. um out of the fridge because that will really extend the life of your wines um but you know we ha- I, we have talked about it they they will go a little bit longer um just err on the side of caution ever so slightly Rogers popped in the chat that Ariso lasts forever. They recently drank a wonderful 80-year-old. I bet that was delicious, Roger. I'm very jealous. <laughs> oh, how lovely. Um, but yeah, we do. I hope we cleared up. I think I did I put the 60 and yeah, the the yeah. other uh Rancy that that so the other producer that Catherine's been talking about, but they're 1960 and they're 1970 vintage, not of their ombre, but of their dark version. Um, yeah. that's what those vintage wines are. Um, and the 1998 is made slightly differently so it's a lighter paler color and it doesn't last quite so long but I'm glad Rogers obviously had something delicious um so very jealous Roger <laughs> oh fabulous um right I think that's all the questions we had a couple more but we've answered them so that's good well done Catherine <laughs> <laughs> and we're nearly we're three minutes before has this ever this happened unheard of um I feel we should stay for three more minutes just so yes. we, just well maybe more just so we can tip ourselves over because well, tell me what your favorite wine was Catherine and members if you were tasting along or if you have a personal penchant for a for a sweet wine let me know let me and Catherine know but which was your favorite of the evening I think I think I will because I'm such a sherry and trifle fan I will have to go for the as you like it but the Samos comes in a very close second. Samos was going to be my second as well. Um, I was going to <laughs> Let's go not tell Rons- Matthew. It's only our second choice. <laughs> um, but I think, um, yeah, I was going to go for the Rossi for my treat wine because it is gorgeous. But um, I will and do keep that Samos in the fridge door over the Christmas period. Um, Kath's just said the Samos for me. I mean, it kind of, yeah gorgeous by itself as well doesn't have to be a treat wine for nine pounds you know and a larger bottle than than some of the others as well so Mm. yeah well I'm glad it got two 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 slots at second place is not bad for a little Greek wine under a tenner absolutely Absolutely. (laughs) it should be very pleased (laughs) good oh well thank you Catherine thank you Um, it's been a pleasure to co-host with you this is our last of the year though isn't it it is co-hosting yes I will be behind the scenes for some more (laughs) 
Well, it's been lovely to share five wines with you again this evening. Um, I will, members, I'll send you around um, the, the wines we've tasted and then also anything else we've mentioned that might be a helpful link, for example, those vintage wines and Madeira, et cetera. Um, I will send that over the weekend. Thank you for joining us again. I hope, fingers crossed, some of you will join myself and um, Ben from the Fine Cheese Company on our cheeses. And then we've also got Sarah Knowles on uh, Champagne Houses. And we have a lovely, really special, 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 special session from Symington's. And if you do like your ports, please check the website because those tasting packs finish sale on Sunday. So um, if you do fancy getting a tasting pack of six ports from Symington's and hearing from two of the Symington family themselves um, on the 13th of December, the packs sell out on Sunday, if not before, if they haven't already sold. So please grab them as quickly as you can. Lovely. Right. I'm going to have another glass of Samos in front of the TV. How delicious. I'm going to finish my travel. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, cheers one and all. And thank you again, Catherine. (laughs) Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.